Very, very happy holidays to, uh, to everyone here. It's great to see friends and colleagues and some new faces here. So very, very happy holidays. Um, for the existing members of the Copyright Society, uh, you know me, I'm Joe Salvo. I am the Vice President, President-Elect of this uh, wonderful, wonderful organization. And I have the privilege of uh, just very briefly introducing uh, the panel here, we have a phenomenal panel today on a very, very interesting topic, uh, termination. It's a topic that, uh, you know, both titillates and terrifies most copyright uh, uh, lawyers, uh, because while it affords, obviously, authors an attempt to uh, recover their copyrights, there are many, many, many pitfalls for the unwary, procedural pitfalls, and uh, not unlike sort of an Indiana Jones movie. And frankly, I can think of uh, no better choices for the uh, title role of uh, Indiana Jones here than the, uh, the casting call that we're about to have here for the uh, three panelists. Um, and with that, I'm going to simply uh, introduce Eric Schwartz, who is moderating the panel. Eric is with Mitchell Silverberg down in Washington, D.C., has graciously joined us coming up on the Acela Express. And with that, Eric, I will turn it over to you to introduce our other two panelists. And away we go. Well, thank you. Um, we, we will hopefully titillate and not terrify. Um, the topic's elusive, and we promise to keep it that way. <laughs> that's right. So um, the two uh, very qualified uh, panelists who probably need uh, no introduction in this group, but I will introduce them anyway, are both two past presidents of the Copyright Society. On my right, Roger Zizou, partner at Frost, Zelnick, Lehrman, and Zizou, and was lead counsel uh, in the Burroughs, Milne, and Siegel cases uh, relevant to today's topic. And on my left, Richard Danay, partner at Cowan, Leibowitz, and Latman, who was lead counsel in the Steinbeck case. Um, we are videotaping today's program, so when we get to the question and answer period, I will repeat the questions for the purposes of those who, uh, if, if any, uh, watch this program um, on, on videotape. It will be on the Copyright Society's website. Uh, I also remind the panelists that because they're being recorded, um, what you say can and will be used against you in a, in a court at some future date. Uh, as that, I would say as moderator, and I've said this before when I've been here at programs, um, my role is to facilitate a discussion. I've had clients on all sides of termination, and I think uh, most of them um, are in the room from uh, <laughs> Marvel, classic, uh, Disney. Uh, Joe Simon is, is not in the room, but uh, having represented at one time or other them. So my role is uh, as a facilitator, uh, the ghost of Barbara Ringer and Erwin Karp uh, at times may surface here in terms, uh, for those unfamiliar with those names, Barbara as the drafter of the 76 Act and Erwin as the chief proponent of the termination provisions. So without further ado, let me turn to and give you the quick uh, uh, outline and summary of issues. Um, let me thank um, David Donahue, who, uh, since I was a somewhat late addition to the panel, who provided for CLE purposes a very long, a very comprehensive outline, which is in your materials. Uh, an outline that pales in comparison to it was prepared by me in three pages, a one-page outline of sort of four major points uh, on the history and context of termination, also in your materials. The mechanics of sections 203 and 304, uh, we're not presuming that you have those uh, either for memory or have even a basic understanding. I could, but I won't read you those sections. Um, the but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, some of the questions and the differences between the sections, which is directly relevant to what's going on. Probably the most interesting area and the area of development recently is what we are calling the renegotiation of rights, especially renegotiations 
short of an actual termination and what the cases are doing with and how they are treating that. And then I just put a marker down, as I like to do, on future battlegrounds and certainly sound recordings, I think it would be fair to say, would, would fit into that category. Um, let me start with the history and context, and then, as I said, I'll talk about the statutory provisions. And then um, the way we have structured this is that uh, Richard's going to talk for a few minutes about some renegotiation issues, and then Roger will talk a little bit about some of the limitations of recapture and, and what we've termed the compromise and what some of the cases are doing. So uh, a, a bit about the history, uh, with apologies for those of you who know all or most of this. The whole notion of the two separate copyright terms from the very origins of copyright law is really very similar to the whole notion of termination, whether in the 14 and 14 year term, the 14 and 28, or ultimately in the 1909 Act, settling on a 28 plus 28 year term of copyright with a renewal meant to, in essence, reset the author's rights to allow them to recapture. And the vesting of the, that renewal term, although they're split in the circuits, either on the last day of the first term or the first day of the new term, which incidentally was somewhat settled in 1992 in the Automatic uh, Renewal Act. But in 1943, the Supreme Court certainly upset that balance. Now, practices had been ongoing for some time, but at least settled in case law in the Fred Fisher music case, changing everything by allowing authors to transfer their renewal term before it had vested. So in essence, to grant a full term of copyright for the original and the renewal term. The purpose of renewal and then termination was, you know, if the author at an early stage of the work can't know and therefore can't contract for the full value of the work, that you're giving an author a, another bite at the apple. It's uh, what was referred to as a balancing of the relative bargaining power between authors and publishers. And for the most part, we were talking in the day of, of book publishing, but also music publishing uh, to a large degree. The legislative response uh, came in the 1976 Act, which of course created a unified single life plus term, life plus 50, now life plus 70, with no renewal period. And the legislative response to Fred Fisher, as you find it in the House report in the 76 Act, says, quote, the unequal bargaining position of authors makes it, quote, an impossibility of determining a work's value until it has been exploited. Um, so the right to recapture, or probably it was better described in the 1965 Register's Supplementary Report as a right to renegotiate, at, at, at least, um, was created with two sections. 304, pertaining to older works and grants before 1978, and 203, pertaining to new works and new grants, but also it can apply to old works, but the grants have to be on or after January 1, 78. With one sort of side note, in 1998, when copyright term was extended, uh, the notion uh, there was to provide an added third bite at the apple for unused terminations, uh, which is something I will not get into. So that's the context of hi and the history. Let me sp speak for a minute about the mechanics, the, uh, the notion that formalities truly live in sections 203 and 304. Let me do this by you know, uh, quickly summarizing what I'll call eight key points of the, dim the differences and similarities of 203 and 304. First and foremost is the similarity between the two. Uh, the author must exercise the right, and they must comply with a series of complex formalities to successfully terminate and recapture. And it's that simple and not often used. Uh, second, the, in terms of the language of the two sections, if you haven't spent time in this sections, and I suppose you're fortunate if you haven't, you'll see a lot of uh, identical language and some of the identical languages. Termination doesn't apply to works made for hire under either provision. And that's consistent with the ultimate purpose that it's supposed to protect authors. Second, what is not recaptured, or, or I guess the flip side, what is recaptured? 
only U.S. rights. It doesn't apply to non-U.S. <coughs> rights. It, it only recaptures copyright. It doesn't recapture other federal rights like trademark or state rights that aren't preempted otherwise by copyright law. Uh, another similarity is that the terminated grantee can continue to exploit the derivative works, quote, prepared under authority of the grant before the termination, utilized under the terms of the grant, which is a much litigated and, and complicated provision, but the grantee cannot, after termination, prepare new derivative works. Um, the other similarity, and one much litigated in the cases of Simon Milne, Classic Media, and Steinbeck, is the language that says the termination is effective notwithstanding any agreement to the contrary. And what an agreement to the contrary is is something that uh, Roger will talk about and Richard will talk as well in the renegotiation issues. The issues of who can terminate, how to do so, even the relevant timing that you've got to file a notice, You've got these windows of time, a lot of similarities, although the actual windows are different, and without confusing the entire room on 56 years from subsistence and 35 years from execution of the grant, there I did it, uh, I will uh, leave, it, leave it at that. But suffice to say, the sections are very similar in the who and how, and somewhat in the timing as well. Um, the statutory successors and how it's done, similarities as well. I will end with one of the major differences, and this, in essence, was a victory, as it were, in the 1976 Act for the publishers, and, and Irwin is spinning in his grave even as I mention it, that Section 203 only applies to grants executed by authors. So from 19, January 178 to present, there is only a termination right if the grant was executed by authors, whereas the 304 grants apply to authors, successors and in interests, survivors and heirs. <coughs> so that was sort of a scaling back, a pulling back, as it were, on the rights <coughs> of authors uh, in that. And last but not least is to simply put a note down that the 203 grants, of course, a lot of what we're talking about are prospective issues because um, for those of you who can do your math in 35-year increments, 1978 and 35 is 2013, so the first grants uh, can't be affected until 2013, although since you can notice people 10 years prior to that, notices can or should have gone out from 2003 until 2011. With that, let me turn first to Richard to talk about uh, renegotiations, and then Roger will say something about the grand compromise. Okay, thanks very much, Eric. I've already received four questions that I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I may not participate in the question. Anyway, my topic is renegotiation. And the question really at the heart of that is to what extent you can bypass statutory termination and choose to rely instead on contractual negotiation uh, do you have alternative routes to get to the goal, which is to recapture rights? Uh, and if you've read the Steinbeck case in the Second Circuit and the Milne case in the Ninth Circuit, the answer is yes, you can rely on either. And more importantly for this discussion, you can rely on either even if some of the statutory heirs are excluded or unhappy with what went on. So what is, what is the objection to renegotiation? Let me start with that as a background. Some contend that renegotiation, voluntary, uh, contractual termination is nothing more than an agreement to the contrary, you're making a new agreement, and a revival of all of the problems uh, of Fred Fisher. Uh, agreement to the contrary, as Eric said, termination of the grant may be effected notwithstanding any agreement to the contrary, etc. and Fred Fisher, uh, the inability, because you can assign your uh, renewal right uh, in advance, uh, and it may be binding on you. You've lost the chance to participate in the commercial success of your work, uh, and that's what people say uh, agreement to the contrary was intended to um, come back. The basic core, boiling it down, uh, situation in Milne and Steinbeck, I think, is you have a pre-1978 grant or agreement, which was revoked, canceled, superseded, gone. Uh, and it was replaced by a post-1978 grant uh, 
uh, on the other side of that line that divides, is the big divide in all of the termination provisions. And so the argument went, and the courts agreed, that Section 304C and D, which apply by their, on their own terms only to pre-1978 grants or agreements, uh, they do not apply in the renegotiation situation because the, after you've replaced the pre-1978 agreement with the post-1978 agreement, there is no longer a pre-1978 agreement intact uh, to terminate. Now, nobody is unhappy unless you're excluded from that process, but it, potential uh, termination parties who are excluded or are unhappy with the result say, wait a minute, the new agreement must be an agreement to the contrary because the, the post-1978 agreement eliminated the only agreement that I could have terminated. But for that new agreement, uh, I would have been able to terminate. Uh, let me give you quickly a fact situation. I'll do the Steinbeck one because I'm obviously most familiar with that. So you will have a framework for seeing how the parties play out here and then I'll get to discuss whether it really is uh, an agreement to the contrary and, and whether it really does violate what we understand uh, was supposed to be the cure for Fred Fisher. Uh, although I think you know where I stand on that. Uh, the copyrights in John Steinbeck's early works, as they were called, uh, included Mice and Men and Grapes of Wrath, uh, the, all of the early works were renewed by Steinbeck in his lifetime, so they vested in him. And under his will, when he died in 1968, he left them outright to Elaine Steinbeck, his third wife. He left money to his two sons by a previous marriage. There was a 1938 agreement which covered all of these early works, and in 1994, some 56 years later, once the life of a copyright, uh, Elaine and Penguin got together and entered a new contract, uh, canceling all of the pre-78 agreements, including that 1938 uh, agreement for those works. Uh, entering this new 1994 agreement, there was actually another agreement too, but I haven't got time for that. Uh, Section 304C was not used by Elaine Steinbeck, and Tom was not a party uh, to the agreement. He wasn't the copyright owner. He had no say in those works, uh, and because there was no statutory termination, he didn't participate in the process. Uh, the agreement called for far better compensation, uh, obviously at a time 56 years later when the value of the works was known. Wasn't this the precise rationale of what termination is supposed to do, better benefits, et cetera. Uh, well, Tom Steinbeck and Blake Smile, uh, the daughter of the son who had died, uh, said, no, uh, we're the statutory heirs and we were cut out. This must be an agreement to the contrary. We were unable to terminate under Section 304C because we didn't have a majority interest. You will know, I mentioned that, uh, the surviving spouse has 50% of the termination interest. The children and the grandchildren who take for uh, who, who take perstirpes own the other 50 percent, but you need a majority uh, to terminate. Well, the plot goes on. Elaine dies in 2003. In her will, she leaves everything, including Steinbeck's copyrights, to her own family, her daughter and her own family. She leaves nothing to Tom uh, or Blake. In 2004, Tom and Blake say, ah, Elaine is dead, we own 100% uh, of the uh, termination interest. Uh, we're gonna serve a termination notice under what is now 304D. Serves the notice, uh, but there's a little problem. That only applies to pre-1978 agreements. And look, there are no pre-1978 agreements. There's only the 1994 agreement for these works. What could give them termination rights? Well, they came up with a theory. Uh, and it lasted for a while, and it was the effect test. The effect test, and I'll come to this in a second, uh, or some variation uh, was the test that uh, is a test that some commentators, including David Nimmer, uh, argue is the correct meaning and an application of uh, uh, agreement to the contrary. It was adopted by the Southern District in Steinbeck and reversed uh, by the Second Circuit. It said basically without much more elaboration than this, uh, that any interpretation of the 1994 agreement, the new agreement, having the effect of disinheriting the statutory heirs to the termination interest, that is Tom and Blake, in favor of Elaine's heirs must be set aside as an agreement to the contrary and contrary to the purposes of the statute. Uh, the Second Circuit 
so, and so uh, Judge Owen uh, in the Southern District uh, upheld the validity of the termination notice. There was appeal, and the Second Circuit reversed and said simply, no, and I quote, we do not read the phrase agreement to the contrary so broadly that it would include any agreement that has the effect of eliminating a termination right, because to do so would collide, really, uh, with other provisions in the statute that explicitly provide uh, for a loss of termination rights. The one I just told you about, for example, and Roger will talk about more, the majority vote rule. Uh, if, there's a, uh, if you don't have a majority, if you only have even 50 percent, there's no termination. Uh, the Second Circuit uh, in Steinbeck, as the Ninth Circuit in uh, Milne did, relied on very strong legislative history uh, saying that contractual termination was a permissible way to terminate uh, in lieu of using statutory termination. What am I talking about? I'll just read one passage. Nothing in the Copyright Act is intended to change the existing state of the law of contracts concerning the circumstances in which an author may cancel or terminate a license transfer or assignment. That was said in connection with both 203 and 304 and both, House, uh, both the House and Senate reports. So basically, you ended up with this rule out of Milne and Steinbeck, that if there was a new post-1978 agreement replacing a pre-1978 agreement, there was nothing in the statute or the legislative history that said somehow or another that pre-1978 agreement, if it was revoked, somehow survives in order to be terminated at a later date by somebody who says they have a termination interest. Okay. Is this Fred Fisher revisited? And I don't think it is. I don't think it has anything to do with the problems of Fred Fisher. I'll give you four reasons and then turn it over to Roger. One is the leverage. The person who's renegotiating has two options. You have statutory termination that you can rely on, if need be, or contractual negotiation. Wielding the, the, the leverage from statutory termination allows you, by, uh, by no ordinary contract route, to get improved benefits, more money, far sooner than statutory termination would ever do. It accomplishes your goal under statutory termination. And particularly in a case like Steinbeck, for example, where you have multiple works by one author, and the rollout of statutory termination could take 10 years or, or longer uh, until the date's caught up, uh, it gives you that option to get the, the, the improvements earlier. Is there the same coercion that was claimed in the case of Fred Fisher? You know, Fred Fisher would say, well, gee, I'm an author, uh, and I've got to, uh, in order to make the deal, I've got to turn over uh, the, uh, uh, my renewal right, and if I'm uh, unlucky enough to live uh, until the second term, it'll be binding on me. Uh, no, there's no such coercion, because you've got, again, two options. You can try to renegotiate, and if that doesn't work, you don't get your improved terms, you go to plan B, which is the statutory termination route. Is there a policy argument that could possibly be in favor of renegotiation? <laughs> Those of you who follow baseball free agency will see it right away. Of course there is. What publisher or studio or anyone else would offer improved terms uh, to, to someone uh, if indeed those new arrangements remained uh, vulnerable to statutory termination in a matter of years? And finally, there's one big factual difference uh, in connection with Fred Fisher and this renegotiation route. In Fred Fisher, it was the person with the renewal interests, with the termination interests now, uh, who himself uh, transferred or waived that right in advance. That was not the case. And so they were saying in the event, even if you do that, we'll protect you and it won't be enforceable. Uh, that's not the case uh, in renegotiation, as you can see from the Steinbeck situation. Uh, Tom and Blake did not convey any uh, transfer, uh, didn't transfer their um, termination interest in advance or waive it. They complained that Elaine Steinbeck did, although she was the copyright owner for the work she entered the contract in. So this is a very sweeping kind of right if you, if you believe that renegotiation is indeed an agreement to the contrary. Uh, if it really is in conflict with the structure of the uh, termination provisions, uh, but before I turn it over to Roger to explain all the limitations and all the exemptions uh, in the termination provisions that show you that there's no guarantee that a termination heir will ever, in fact, uh, acquire any rights, remember one thing, that when you hear about the termination statute, it is not a no heirs left behind kind of statute. There is no guarantee. <laughs> Roger, over to you. Okay. Thanks. Um, I want to talk about the, um, the judicial 
really uh, the judicial treatment recently of the limitations on the right of termination and the scope of a termination. Now, putting aside renegotiation, which Richard has covered, there was a similar fact pattern uh, in, in its core uh, in the Milne case, and uh, those lengthy uh, decisions are in your materials. Uh, because I'm going to talk uh, somewhat about the Siegel case, which is a series of district court decisions in the Central District of California, I just want to mention some of the background to that case. And I'll also mention the first termination case that was, uh, in which there was a reported decision was Burroughs against MGM. In Burroughs against MGM, the heirs of Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, served a termination notice on, on the family corporation, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Inc., and uh, sought to terminate uh, all, all rights granted uh, over the years and in, in many grants to that corporation, and in, in particular a 1923 grant um, and then uh, in, in the Siegel case w is a little unusual because you have a joint author authored work by Jerome Siegel, who uh, wrote the continuity, and Joseph Schuster, who did the artwork for the famous uh, Superman uh, character, the first comic book, and other uh, subsequent comic book and newspaper strips embodying that character. The, a joint work under the statute uh, if, you, if there are 50 percent uh, of the uh, owners of the termination right involved, there can be a termination. And in that situation, the Siegel case, uh, under 304C, only the heirs of Jerome Siegel served a termination notice on uh, DC Comics, which was the comic book company that had received the original grant from them in March of 1938 for the first Superman comic. Uh, there were certain twists that that joint authorship add to uh, and, and pitfalls that I'll talk about in a minute. But the, res <clears throat> the result of a termination served by only one set of uh, two e equally uh, situated heirs is that the grant from the other co-author is left in place, leaving the, the grantee, the original grantee, uh, as a, as a co-owner with the terminating heirs, the Siegel heirs. So in the uh, DC comic situation, uh, uh, DC Comics was left as the uh, in place as co-owner of the rights, the Superman rights that the Seagulls uh, recaptured. At least they recaptured their share, and then they they now have a relationship as co-owners. Uh, with that background, first of all, um, what limitations? Um, I'm talking about the, I'm going to inevitably talk about the statute, but really I want to talk about the judicial treatment of the statute in this regard. The judicial treatment of, of uh, the form, formalities uh, has taken place in a couple of uh, decisions. In the Burroughs case, the first uh, issue that came up on that subject was that the, the heirs of Edgar Rice Burroughs did not list five Tarzan works in the notice of termination. And the Second Circuit held that the omission or the leaving out of those uh, five works did not mean that the, uh, the rest of the transfer was invalid, but the, the, the rest of the termination notice was invalid. But as to those five works, it was not effective, leaving in place the right of the original grantee to continue to exploit those five Tarzan works. In Siegel, there was also an omission in the notice of termination, which was, I think, 546 pages long, there were, there were comic book strips from January of 1939 featuring a Superman uh, that had been left out of the notice of termination. Now, under Burroughs and the regulation, which requires an identification of the title of the work and the author, at least one author, uh, in order for there to be a termination, uh, the argument was made on, on my side of the case, and by the way, I wasn't, I wasn't lead counsel in the case. I was, uh, I was the, uh, the counsel that argued all the copyright issues for that. But the question that that's, came that's up. That's lead as far as we're concerned. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> you, you did qualify that as far as the issues are concerned. I don't want to overrepresent. But um, in, in any event, the issue came up, why would not the, leave, the omission of those, of those works, those comic strips, not uh, and, and not identified at all in the uh, notice of termination, uh, why would that not have led to the same result as in Burroughs? Uh, 
where you leave out five works, they're not covered, you can't terminate them. And the, and the, uh, the answer given by Judge Larson was um, a, a painful, tortured, and, uh, and perverse decision. <laughs> the last time around against an argument, a re-argument, a, a, an angry decision where he, he I, I feel, as a judge, lost it. In, <laughs> in, in any event, what he said was, there may have been no mention of the title, there may have been no mention uh, of any author or anything else about the work, but there was a catch-all used. The catch-all said that any work that embodied any of the attributes or indicia of, of Superman was covered, such as Clark Kent, Mon Pa Kent, uh, Lois Lane, The Daily Planet, uh, The Planet Krypton, and a bunch of others. The judge said, well, wait a minute. Those two weeks of strips included for the first time the planet Krypton. So this is not the same as Burroughs. It did not leave out these, these, the notice didn't leave out these works. It's right in there. So, you know, 60, 70 years later, anybody who's a recipient of such a notice, which is supposed to give you reasonable notice of what works are affected, uh, you, you, you're on notice that, 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 uh, that those two comics, two months of comic strips was meant. So he said it wasn't like Burroughs, there wasn't a complete omission of any information. And then he said, then to the extent every, anything else is, is left out, it's harmless error. Now the harmless error provision only applies to mistakes in the notice, not the leaving out of the identity of a work from the notice. But he, having said that the, there was a reference uh, in, the, uh, in the notice to these two strips by mentioning Krypton, he then said the rest is all harmless error. And um, uh, you, you have to read it, and uh, someday you may, you may be up against it. I should remind you that all the decisions in the Siegel case are those of a district judge. Uh, there, is, there is no final decision yet. The case has not gone to trial on the ultimate ultimate accounting issues in the case. So we don't have a final decision yet at all, let alone in the district court. But um, there is, uh, so that's a technical formality you'll have to uh, keep in mind and, uh, and as a defendant uh, be looking for and as, a, and as, as somebody advising, uh, be careful to do your best with. I really wouldn't rely on the catch-all provision. Uh, in addition, since there's a distinction, for example, made in the regulations between the identification, the identification of a grant, which need only be reasonably identified, there is no such qualification on the language of identification of a title, and furthermore, uh, in, the, um, in the harmless uh, error, error provisions, uh, there's, there's a, a condition, it doesn't affect the validity of the notice, only the coverage of the notice, possibly. Uh, what about other, uh, other limitations? Uh, there are different limitations in, in that stem from the introductory language of uh, 304C itself, uh, and I will read that because it's very brief, um, which you'll, so you can follow the rest of this because it all depends on this language. The language is the following. In the case of any copyright subsisting in either its first or renewal term on January 1, 1978, that's one thing, other than a copyright and a work made for hire, another thing, the exclusive or non-exclusive grant or transfer of a license of the renewal copyright or any right under it executed before January 178 by any of the persons designated by the statute, uh, other than by will, that's another thing, is subject to termination. So it was a there have been a series of decisions uh, limiting uh, the rights and the scope of the rights granted, granted in the Siegel case, of which you should be aware. Um, first of all, the court recognized in its first decision the so-called termination gap. If a work has not been published, and it has not either been registered under Section 12 of the 1909 Act, or registered for protection as a published work that bore a copyright notice, uh, then it was not in copyright in its original or renewal term on January 1, 1978, and the work is not subject to termination. There have been debates about that and whether that's right or it should be the case, but Judge Larson did find that uh, that, that applied. A second, on works for hire, uh, 
He went through analysis mm -hmm. of many works, and that one aspect of the uh, Siegel situation you may not be aware of is, is Siegel and Schuster transferred all of their rights under copyright and other rights on March 1, 1938, to the comic book company. Thereafter, uh, several months thereafter, in September of 1938, they signed an employment agreement and went really on, on a kind of payroll, and they became employees for hire. So as to the subsequent comic books, and eventually a similar kind of arrangement made, made their work in the <clears throat> with respect to newspaper strips, works made for hire. So as a result of that, the, the judge held that everything but the first Superman comic book and two other comic books that used pre-existing material uh, and the two weeks of January 1939, all other works done by Siegel and Schuster themselves uh, after March 1, 1938, were works made for hire. So that is an enormous cutting down of what was at stake, although obviously the first comic book uh, delineating a character is the most important. Um, transfers by will are not subject to termination. You know, these family things can get pretty uh, contentious. Uh, what, about, what about somebody, uh, an author, who decides to leave everything to his best friend or his lover? Um, it's a tr in a will. It's not subject to termination. Uh, a lot of people might not like that. They may argue about it. It may raise a state issue under New York law, and then you have a question of whether New York law might, over, might be inconsistent with federal law. But, but as a matter of copyright termination, Congress chose not to get into that, and it looks like that would not be subject to copyright termination. What about joint works? As, as I've mentioned, they, they provide the twist that it may leave in place. Uh, the, the original grantee may become a co-owner with a terminating uh, heir. Uh, there are two very important consequences of that. The blocking right of the, of the terminating party does not exist because a co-owner can exercise rights in the work subject only to a duty to account, and that, and that brings into in, into play the, the second aspect of that, the duty to account uh, is that of a, a co-owner. You, you haven't done anything wrong by being the owner of a co-owned right, such as DC Comics is, and, and the, it, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, th there's no negative inferences from being a co-owner and going through an accounting. Um, and, but the, the co-owner, the terminating heirs, in theory, could also exercise the rights and, and have to share with an accounting. But that doesn't work when there's a trademark right involved because trademark rights, as we'll hear in a second, are not subject to termination. And the owner of the trademark is the only party that can use the trademark, and that may, in effect, be a, a blocking right by the, uh, by the original grantee uh, insofar as um, whether the terminating uh, party can exercise any, uh, any of the termination right, terminator rights themselves. Uh, that, that also brings into play questions uh, about, about profits um, and what is attributable to what's terminated. While you're a co-owner, you're supposed to account for, to the other co-owner for their share of the profits, but it would be their share of the profits with respect to the terminated copyrightable material and not other materials such as trademarks. So you can see the hornet's nests of things that go on with respect to termination uh, in the profit, in, the, in that kind of a joint work situation. Then we have the other express limitations in the statute, the so-called derivative work exception with respect to derivative, uh, the, the, uh, the terminating heirs only recapture the right to prepare new derivative works based on the terminated the terminated work. In addition, uh, in 304C, there's a provision which has a host of other very important limitations, and it reads, uh, just to give you the actual words, which is the answer to the questions you might have, the termination of a grant under this subject affects only those rights covered by the grant that arise under this title, that's Title 17, it's copyright and in no way affects rights arising any, under any other federal, that would be a trademark statute, state, could be trademark, unfair competition, or foreign laws. Uh, foreign copyrights are not 
subject to termination. So foreign licensing is left in place. That's another limitation on the termination right. Uh, Just about. Okay. Uh, so you have a number of these these things, and then and then the question is, well, why are all these limitations? What's going on? I spoke. This was supposed to be for the benefit of the author and the author's heirs. Well, it was a compromise. Every case that's dealt with this situation reminds the the reader that this is a legislative and policy compromise. And you know there are lines drawn, and you, you and you heard about Irwin Karp's losing out on the. Uh, on one of them, and uh, that's, that's the way it ends up. So it's not all it's cracked up to be. I have one further comment. You ask, well, what happens at the end of this? What's the benefit of termination? What if the terminating heir's lawyer wants to litigate every one of these issues, many of which are obvious on the face of the statute, and goes through it for all the years? He's going to fight everything, and that's the Siegel case. In, Ap in April of 1997, there was a notice of termination served. In, 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 it became effective two years later in April of uh, 90, 1999. Litigation was commenced in 2004. All of these issues having been litigated in the case, it has not yet gone to trial. We're almost at 2011, and the accounting issues are how you're going to wrap all these things up will be tried. You have to wonder about a case like that. Not one penny has been paid to Joanne Siegel, who's in her early 90s, or her daughter, who's got a serious health problem in her mid or late 50s, uh, and that's where that stands. Uh, so, it will well, all be in the public domain before it's resolved. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and that's a common. I mean, uh, Joe, I, I Joe Simon have, was uh, 89, I think, when he was uh, litigating. I should add one still thing. alive in 96. Uh, the, Ju <clears throat> the Joseph Schuster heir served a, two, a 304 D termination notice, which will take effect in 2013. There'll be a blocking right then. <clears throat> So, I mean, given all of that, given the limitations, given the compromise, I guess I would begin with the simplest of questions, pulling back, of looking down from 50,000 feet, and ask the two of you, how effective is it in rewarding authors with additional money, um, which was, after all, its intended purpose? Well, uh, I mean, I think none of us have any statistics. We don't have any empirical evidence. Uh, but I think it's fair to say it provides an opportunity under the carefully limited uh, compromises that have been made, but it doesn't provide a guarantee. Uh, and so even if you get the rights back, if those rights aren't worth anything uh, in works that aren't worth anything, you're not going to make a lot of money. So it's not a lottery ticket. But it does provide a reasonably uh, a reasonable opportunity uh, to get additional income from uh, properties. No, and I think that's right, because obviously, I don't know, unless anyone do, uh, here does, that there have ever been statistics like there was done on the number of renewals during automatic renewal uh, legislation in 1992 about the n overall numbers, I don't know how you would account for, of termination notices served, but the obvious is, which is my forte is stating the obvious, uh, <laughs> is that the really valuable works uh, are, are noticed. Um, but often litigated, and much of it is internal family feuds, witness the Steinbecks. Um, I guess, I mean, do, do you think it's, is it working? Uh, yeah, I think it's working. Uh, there are lines that have been drawn, and within those lines it's working. Certainly uh, in, in uh, a case like uh, where you have a, a valuable character and, and you recapture the rights in the first work, that gives you some rights. The question is, what are they worth? And you have to be realistic and go through them. They're certainly worth something. In the, but, mul yeah. in the multiple works scenario, the comic books are a good example. Um, <coughs> how do the authors and publishers at the end of the day, I mean, if, if the notion of it was supposed to be some clean break, author created a work, singular, and then <laughs> author gets it back and can either renegotiate with that publisher or with others and earn more money, it seems like often many of these cases are, you know, hundreds of works, the 500 plus page, six pound termination notice in Superman. And what the author ends up with is some blocking, some right of interference. Um, even were he to or she to get back that iteration 1.0 of the original character or work, what if anything can 
she do with that when she doesn't have trademark, doesn't have foreign rights, doesn't have derivative works created in the interim? Well, the answer there is when you have a, a very valuable character, you, when you can keep going back to the well, you're talking about movies uh, as a real source of tremendous income. So the, the right to prohibit uh, the making of a, a post-termination derivative motion picture is worth an enormous amount of money. But that's what it is. It's not all the other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think also one thing that does make it work is uh, is renegotiation, uh, despite its detractors as saying, oh, you know, agreement to the contrary and undermines uh, the act. I think it's it's when you consider the long rollout of statutory termination, how long it takes really mm -hmm. to uh, get back all of those rights, especially if they're multiple works. The renegotiation with the leverage provided by statutory termination, I think, gets you to a contract. It may not benefit everyone, but I think it does bring about those uh, benefits sooner uh, than statutory termination uh, could ever do. And ironically, if I have a second, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that second contract uh, in the Steinbeck case. Uh, there were really two contracts negotiated by Elaine Steinbeck. Uh, in 1994. Uh, Tom Steinbeck was excluded from the, uh, the first one for the early works. He wasn't the copyright owner and she didn't use statutory termination. But they negotiated a second contract that covered the later works. What were the later works? The later works were those uh, that involved posthumous renewals, the renewals made uh, after uh, John Steinbeck had died. And in those, uh, Tom Steinbeck was a uh, renewal beneficiary and shared uh, with Elaine Steinbeck. So by negotiation, he got much better term, negotiation uh, prompted by Elaine Steinbeck, who we fought uh, later, uh, he got much better terms for the works that were involved in the renewal copyrights much sooner than he ever would. And one glorious footnote to all of that, one of the works in that second contract was East of Eden. Oh, so you say East of Eden, Jimmy Dean movie. No, say Oprah. Because Oprah selected East of Eden uh, as her first choice when she reconstituted her book club, and Oprah is the greatest bookseller in all of humanity. So Tom Steinbeck didn't do too badly. I, I think I would agree with Richard. Uh, the threat of termination and the long rollout, and by the way, Congress was not unaware of the long rollout. They, they mandated, they, they, that they enacted it. Uh, they also said in the legislative history, as Richard read, uh, or mentioned that uh, the right of authors and, and publishers to terminate prior grants and enter new ones was enshrined in the legislative history mm -hmm. and in the statute as a result. Uh, to the con uh, Scalia, to the contrary, notwithstanding about legislative <laughs> history. Uh, but um, freedom of contract is a core thing in this country. And unless Congress says they're reducing it, very clearly, it remains, and freedom of contract is the source of renegotiation. And uh, in, in the Siegel case, there was, a, there was a kind of renegotiation too, but there was an issue in the case as to whether the, the uh, culminated settlement had been signed properly or, uh, or, or culminated, uh, and that's a sidelight. But renegotiation is the route to go because when people make a deal based on what's in, in the uh, uh, what the value is in the marketplace, everybody leaves the room happy. Well, I'll open to questions in just a few minutes, but let's stick to the point on renegotiation I for like a minute. I like your questions better. I think we can answer them. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we discussed good. some of them. That helps. Um, the, so the, this... The best spontaneous speech is one that takes two, two weeks to prepare. So if, if the this, this Second and Ninth Circuits have spoken on renegotiation, and, and Richard said, to sort of quickly summarize, if it's leaving aside the legislative history, it's certainly consistent with the public policy. You're in the window of termination. I mean, my factors to summarize. You're in the window of the notice, but you don't notice, because then you're duty-bound to only that publisher. You have to know about your termination right, and the courts in the second and ninth clearly want you to eyes wide open. You have to explicitly revoke or cancel the earlier agreement. And then fourth and most important, which certainly serves the public policy, the author has to get or heirs a lot more money, or at least more money. Mewborn was $5,000. Milne was $100 million. Mewborn, not enough. Uh, Milne, enough. 
how much <laughs> is enough? I mean, well, a couple questions in there to just open for the discussion. One is, so only the second and ninth have spoken on renegotiation. Is this something that we expect the other courts will follow suit or that we need, leg I can't imagine, legislative reform on termination? Uh, given the 30 seconds that you have with members of Congress to talk about any legislation, one can only imagine that conversation on termination issues with a congressional staff or a member of Congress. Um, but so they have spoken, do we need legislation or do, you know, do the other courts speak? And then if so, where do they draw the lines on additional compensation in terms of making it work? Well, I, I mean, if, if you're talking about renegotiation in a voluntary situation where you're simply negotiating with the other side and you do have the leverage of statutory termination, so you can rely on that, whether you can rely on it then or in a year or two years or whatever it is, uh, you do have that leverage. I, I, I don't think you can start to look into, you know, gee, how much was it worth to that person? Uh, it, it's worth what they get and, what, and partly what they, they ask for. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? Set up termination uh, compensation review boards to review uh, the adequacy of the, of the New Deal in each situation. And they, I mean, you know, you can imagine, oh God, uh, you can imagine uh, what a nightmare that would be. I mean, there has to be some common sense at some point. You've, you've provided the leverage through statutory termination. Uh, you're allowing parties to renegotiate, and if they do it correctly, following all these rules, uh, it will work. Uh, at that point, you have to kind of leave them alone and, and let them figure it out for themselves. I just don't think you can regulate uh, within that. Well, first of all, I think the Second and the Ninth Circuits have spoken. CERT has been denied in these cases. I think other courts will follow because these are very well-reasoned, persuasive opinions. Uh, I, I agree with, with what Richard was saying. Uh, not only can Congress not legislate how much and, and to get Congress to go back and legislate anything would be difficult, but I don't think the courts sh should raise their voices too loud in trying to say how much is enough, unless there's some obvious, uh, something that obvious that looks lousy. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the basis for termination, at, whether privacy, privately or by, by statute, is based on assessment of the value of the work at a point at which its value can be appreciated. Well, that market value is what the parties will renegotiate, and presumably if they come to a certain price, who's to second-guess them in our society? Mm -hmm. Well, but that, then that raises the agreement to the contrary language, because if, <coughs> if they were to be in a weaker uh, negotiation, negotiating position and took less money, then the courts would say that's an agreement to the contrary. But I suppose the, the short answer would be, well, then wait till termination and terminate. I, I think I have some answer on that. It may be when is more important the renegotiation takes place than uh, what dollar uh, figures uh, people came to. That, that, that's a, a serious question I don't know the answer to. If you, you do it seven years later and, and you know, 50 years later, the work has is, is changed. And, I think the when may be more important than the exact amount. What, ab what about the formalities? Uh, are courts more likely to trend towards um, permitting harmless errors, given the you know the 500-page termination notices, the complexity of the notices, the filings, the filing at the copyright office? Um, this is sort of the last gasp of formalities, as it as it were. Well, I, I think. Um, the tendency or the willingness to do that by Judge Larson in the Siegel case, uh, I think reflects that he reached a view that the Siegels should do better than he found out they were doing when he was cornered in a series of motions and had to peel this apart and throw this out and throw this out. And in the end, he, he pulled a, a rabbit out of the hat with a harmless error and, and something where there was no identification of a work and a notice. Um, and uh, so those kinds of reactions are going to come into play mm -hmm. uh, from judges and district judges. Well, if these things ever get to a, uh, an appellate level, I think they'll be looked at w on a more uh, a reasonable and uh, um, independent and <laughs> unbiased uh, way. But uh, those are, I, I, I think it's dangerous to, to tamper with the uh, compromise that Congress uh, 
uh, drew carefully after 20 years of legislation. The statute took almost 20 years to arrive, and so, uh, but it, it will happen. How, it, well, how, if at all, Paul, I'll take your question in a few yeah. minutes. How, if at all, would, uh, will courts react? I mean, the dividing line clearly is the work for hire. This is the Joe Simon, the Simon case, for example. Uh, if work for hire, no termination. If not work for hire. So how, if at all, will this impact the treatment by courts, and uh, we're talking uh, old law, old works, of works for hire? Will courts liberalize what is not a work for hire or no impact whatsoever? I don't think so. They won't liberalize it. it, it it's already a very balanced, there's a considerable ba level of jurisprudence on what's a work made for hire under the 1909 Act. Um, it, it, uh, it's the basis for all the decisions where people were fighting about renewal rights and now termination rights. Uh, there are Ninth Circuit opinions, many of them. There are Second Circuit opinions. There are Fifth Circuit opinions. The courts are very careful about that. They're not going to throw that out the window. But it comes out in a very fair and balanced way, and it will continue with regard to termination. I'll just add one thing uh, on the circuit. There's no question in my mind, and Roger and I would certainly agree, that the Second <laughs> Circuit and the Ninth Circuit opinions in Milne and Steinbrecher were well reasoned, cert was denied in each. But those people who oppose renegotiation see it as an agreement to the contrary, see it as, you know, the Fred Fisher trick uh, revived, uh, are certainly looking for another circuit in which uh, maybe they'll come up with an opinion that's at odds with those two. Uh, they haven't uh, given up by any means, as you will hear uh, in the future. Uh, you know, although cert was denied, uh, a lot of emphasis was placed in those, um, in those petitions on the uh, Lassie case, the Mewborn case, being uh, in conflict uh, with both Steinbeck and, and, and Milne, in a sense, uh, and it wasn't. Uh, in the Lassie case, there was a pre-1978 agreement that survived, and it was terminated, and the facts uh, were really consistent with the two cases, but there were a lot of allegations that there was a conflict. Supreme Court didn't buy it. They didn't grant uh, cert, but uh, obviously, I think people, some people uh, who are opposed to this uh, think that, uh, you know, it would be nice if the Seventh Circuit or another circuit weighed in. Okay. Well, let's open it up to questions and play stump the panel now. Uh, Alan, you were first. <laughs> with respect, Roger, with respect to no right to terminate dispositions by will, fact situation, author is deceased, no spouse, one child, has a will. So the people who would ordinarily have the right under the will do not have the right. Does the child have the right? What is the what's the author doing? The author. What, what does he, he want to do? The author's dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be alive. <laughs> well, the will. The will he left said what? The will left it to two people, one of which was a trust for the benefit of the child, I get it. and the other one was another person. Well, so the will people are out, but can the child, as child? Terminate. Well, you, 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 you're talking about termination. If, if all of his assets were disposed of by the will, he can't terminate. If, if, if cutting him out in some way um, of, of the, what he would have had under termination is some violation of state law, you know, uh, there's duress or something else is involved in that, uh, out of his, 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 he could, you know, waive the will and I'm not an expert in this, but uh, pursue his intestate chair, you, you have an issue of whether the federal copyright law precludes state law from coming into play. It may not. They may, they may meld, but that's a different issue. But uh, he doesn't have a right to terminate if, uh, with this, when there's been a disposition by will. It says that right in the statute. The interesting question, though, I think on that, and it, and it could have come up in Steinbeck but didn't, uh, is, okay, a transfer uh, by will is, is exempt from termination. Right. But uh, another transfer that has the same impact in upsetting the testamentary plan, uh, would that indirect effect uh, qualify and come within the exemption? There's no litigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Nancy? Curious about how you see 203 interacting with 201C and the privilege to create a revision 
under that. So here's a fact scenario. Um, the owner of a collective work grants a right to digitize content lawfully under 201C, and then subsequently a contributor to that collective work terminates. Um, it's not a derivative work. Can that digitized version continue to be displayed? Well, Amy, sh tell her what she's won. <laughs> she, she's <laughs> well, probably not. Probably not. I mean, it's a privilege that was exercised at, within the appropriate time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, movies aren't withdrawn if, you know, if there's a termination. A movie if it's not a derivative work, then the grant has been terminated. It's subject to termination, even though it's a non-exclusive, because if, if you, you know, uh, the, the, you're not limited to terminating transfers, you, which are exclusive, transfers of exclusive rights. It can be a, an exclusive or non-exclusive right. So they're, they're cut off. But it has to be a mistake. In well, way. wait a minute. Now I have, I'm having a second thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a second thought. The if, if, the, if the right uh, to reuse under 201C arises by statute, then it does not arise by grant, and, and that, that would prevail. Yeah. Right. Okay. Charlie? Um, I, I think on a dollar basis, by far, the most important question involving termination coming up over the next few months or years is the ability of producers and uh, recording artists to terminate potentially uh, assignments under purported work for hire agreements to record companies of master recordings. Do you guys have any feelings on that? <laughs> I have a feeling it sounds like a lot of work for hire litigation. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's where I was going, Charlie, with the question about the treatment of works for hire, and especially, you know, it's so fact specific in, in knowing the instance and expense test in, in, you know, an era of how many years ago, the parties, assuming they're alive, uh, all being able to <coughs> rightfully collect the facts about the creation of the work. Uh, for those of you who missed it, there was a legislative reform in 1999. There was a legislative re-reform in 2000, which put back the status quo ante with legislative history that said, in essence, never mind uh, what was done in 1999 as it pertained to sound recordings, making them the 10th uh, prong for the not regular salaried employees. Uh, and with sound recordings, what about joint authorship? That could be a hornet's nest of, uh, what is this thing about cutting in that people talk about and becoming a co-owner? If, if something's co-owned and, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, the co-owner's grant may be left in place. You know, I mean, it may be that the facts work out that, you know, who rented the studio and who brought the parties together thing. and how the production was done and whether that meets instance and expense, you know, it's just anticipating the, the cases, presumably, but. Uh, yeah, Paul? Um, in both Steinbeck and in Milne, in the renegotiations, there was an explicit revocation of the earlier agreement, mm -hmm. and the courts cited that. Um, have there been any courts that have addressed situations where um, uh, the renegotiation was in the window there was substantial uh, compensation paid, but the, but the parties did not go to the formality of, of revoking the earlier agreement. Well, the Lassie case is one, because uh, the Lassie, I, I'm not sure I'm remembering the dates, but the 1976 uh, agreement, uh, there was a 1978 agreement that basically sort of restated uh, the grant in the 1976 76. agreement and then added on to it, but did not revoke the earlier agreement, and that was still subject to termination. And the question of what? But in Lassie, had there been a substantial amount of um, compensation instead of the $5,000, mm -hmm. um, um, do you think the court would have dealt with the possibility of um, uh, intended or implied revocation of the earlier agreement? 
Um, or de facto, you mean? You know, de facto. I mean, what I was think the intent of the parties? Right. At least in the other cases, it seems like they really want to see that the parties know exactly what they're doing, and they really want to see them revoke. I think in the Lassie case, the other issues, of course, was what was the scope of the regranted rights, if anything? Was it just a refreshing of existing rights? Uh, was there potentially some new add-on or not? And, I, and so there was that as well. I, I would presume they would want a, a much cleaner break in, to allow renegotiations, but I could be wrong. Yeah, David. Yeah, um, there doesn't seem to be any procedure to how to deal with these notices. And in certain instances, it seems like it might be a good strategy to wait um, where there may be deficiencies in the notice, where there may be a work for hire issue. Mm -hmm. um, have you had any, any thoughts on practically what's the best? Is there, is there a general approach that, that uh, works in terms of yeah, responding to these notices? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, are you, you're talking maybe about a stat, whether or not to sue. A notice has to be served. A notice has to be served, but... It has to be recorded. Right, but do you have to respond to it if you're, if you're the, the grantee? Well, I... Do you, do you have to... Um, is there any... Is there any... Um, you know? there, there, are not, there are not clear rules, but, but you, why run the risk of not responding? You, you probably ought to write some kind of a letter rejecting it. Because if they're still within the notice period, they could we notice you a cor correct official. Well, that's true, and maybe you have to wait when, before you do that. That's right. Well, and that, you know, and the alternative strategy, if it's, <laughs> if it's an agree, if it's someone that you've been working with and you want to continue the relationship, I suppose that's why the renegotiation cases are so important <clears throat> as a practical matter, because at least if both parties know what they can do by way of renegotiation and not be concerned about a later termination. I mean, yours is the much riskier, what if the termination is invalid and there is no termination? But, you know, yes, but the risk of litigation for that weighed against a renegotiation with a good relationship with an existing party, author, and everything may be worth it. Gloria, you'll have the last word. Oh, I hope this is not a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll have the last word, <laughs> but not here. <laughs> David, there's another problem with that, is that if you wait till the, till the actual time when the negotiation becomes effective, then you've waited long enough for that party to go elsewhere to negotiate. And there's a five-year window, so it's going to continue. They can, they can get to that first effective date. And you've sat there and, you know, hoping there will be an error. And by the way, I don't agree with, with Eric to the extent, I mean, maybe it makes us look very valuable. But if you read the statute and the regs carefully, you can write a termination notice that's accurate. So it's not that hard. <laughs> and uh, there's still, you know, work for higher issues. Well, yeah, well, uh, well the, 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 there's no question the recording companies are going to deal with their, with their registration of their works for works for hire, but good luck. <laughs> I, I think there are some things uh, a re-notification a re can change, but work for hire, I would think not. Well, um, sort of in the, thank you to, to Roger and to Richard um, very much. I just... A special thank you to Eric Schwartz for uh, moderating here today as well. Thanks for coming up. Have a very, very happy holiday season, everyone. Thank you for coming.